Hey, what's going on guys? Jay's Two Cents here, and if you can't tell by this table of parts and stuff in front of me, today we're gonna to talk about some of the beginner mistakes people make. I know I've made this video before in the past, but with the new generation stuff out, and a lot of people building their first computers finally, I figured it was time for a refresher to kinda of get some of the new confusion in this thisness out of the way so that you guys don't build your computer and then go, ah, oh, shit. NZXT's Build is a quick and easy way to get a new gaming computer. Build a gaming PC on your budget using the built-in configurator and see exactly how your favorite games will perform. Want to build your own PC but still have the NZXT peace of mind warranty? Then the new BLD Build-It-Yourself kit has what you want. Buy it and build it yourself and NZXT has you covered. To get started configuring or building your next gaming PC, visit the build link in the description below. So there's a lot of new parts available on the market. Um, obviously there's new gen graphics cards, which isn't really that important. I mean, PCI Express sockets the same through PCIe Gen 1 all the way up through Gen 5 now. That's, that's not the kind of stuff I'm talking about. I'm talking about how easy it is now to accidentally uh, mismatch your CPU and your platform or mismatching your RAM or setting your RAM up so that your PC won't actually boot. Um, little things like that, all the way down to just some basic builder mistakes that you may not even know were mistakes until this video points it out and you look at your system and you go, huh, you know, we've all done that, we've all been there. And I've been building computers for 30 years now, over 30 years now. And it's one of those things where you still make these kinds of mistakes far into like building experience. So I figured might as well at least give you guys a little bit of an opportunity to, to avoid these experiences by knowing what they are before you ever experience them. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and start with some of the confusion um, and things to think about regarding the newest platforms from both Intel and AMD. Intel uh, has a, a brand new socket type called LGA1700. If you ever wonder what that number means, it's basically just the number of pins. It's, it's just that simple. Uh, but LGA1700 is kind of confusing in the sense that some motherboards will only work with 1700 brackets. Now these brackets are gonna be, whether they're AIOs or air coolers, they have to be able to attach through the motherboard in some way. So this right here is an ASUS TUF uh, Z690 plus Wi-Fi D4 motherboard. A couple things to think about with that naming. One. Intel currently has both for 12th gen and 13th gen CPUs, availability to use DDR4 or DDR5. So first and foremost, it would be easy for you to accidentally get DDR5 because you're like, oh, it's a new platform, it uses DDR5, and then accidentally pair it with a DDR4 motherboard, meaning you'll either have to change your motherboard or your RAM. Depending on the RAM that you got, both could be about the same price. So be mindful of your particular motherboard that you're using for Intel's 12th and 13th gen because of the fact that they are compatible with both, but you have to buy the motherboard that's designed for both. This exact motherboard, the TUF, is available in a D4 and a D5. D4 for DDR4 and D5 for DDR5. But let's talk about the cooler here for a second. Because the CPU socket is bigger and it uses LGA1700, you're gonna need a compatible LGA1700 cooler. Now, usually the only thing that denotes whether or not a cooler is gonna be compatible with the new Intel sockets, and there's been a lot of sockets over the years, is basically the standoff spacing. See, Intel doesn't come with any sort of backplate mounted to their CPU. There's some tape on there that got stuck from this backplate. But anyway, it is intended for the cooler to provide its own backplate mounting solution. So what that means is with the additional width and 1700 being a bigger socket means the square, and it is a perfect square by the way, versus AMD has always been more of a rectangle, the spacing of the holes gets wider. So what that means is that if you're going to use a bracket that's compatible with 1700, it must come with the appropriate 1700 bracket for your cooler. Most coolers today, depending on overstock that's still sitting on shelves from prior to 12th gen even launching, will include a 1700 bracket, or at the very least, you can contact the manufacturer if it does not have one and request one. Most of the time they'll provide one for free or you can buy one off Amazon. Usually they're like 10 bucks depending on the manufacturer. But one, you may not even need that. And the reason why I say that is if you take a look at the mounting holes on the motherboard, you'll notice on the 1700 motherboards, the LGA 1700 boards, 12th gen, 13th gen, you might see this kind of a double hole. It looks like a, a, a number eight, where there's two holes drilled on there. And the reason for that is it's compatible with both 1700 brackets and pre-1700 brackets, meaning these motherboards that have the double holes like this will work with just about any of the Intel coolers in the last like 10 years. 
So that's something to keep in mind. Most Intel brackets that you'll find now are adjustable like this guy, where you can actually just push the bracket out to match where it is supposed to line up. This particular one right here supports LGA 775, 11.5X. There's what really called 11.5X is because there was a 11.55 and 11.56, and then uh, 13.66. But as you saw, it also works. Jeez, that tape is very sticky. It also works on the LGA 1700 board because the board supports the older cooler brackets, not the other way around. So sort of another mention here though, when it comes to AMD's new AM5 motherboard, and this is gonna probably end up throwing out my shoulder, this board is so heavy. This is a Crosshair Extreme AMD AM5 motherboard. It is the first motherboard from AMD in a long time to be LGA, which is land grid array, or means the pins are on the motherboard, not on the CPU, which you're typical, typically used to seeing. Now, these motherboards were designed with backwards compatibility in mind, sort of like the motherboard I just showed for Intel. The difference being, if you have to use a cooler that requires the removal of the AMD backplate to use the cooler's own backplate, it will not work. Let me repeat that. This backplate piece right here on the back of the AM5 motherboard, on many AMD motherboards in the past, AM4, AM3, AM3+, Plus, would require you, especially water blocks and such, would require you to remove the backplate, the four screws that are on there, and then these two plastic retention clips that are on here would remove, and then you'd use their backplate and pass through screws, and you would just get rid of the AMD mounting system altogether. That is not possible with the AM5 because these four screws on the inside of the back bracket are what's actually holding down the LGA mounting system. So if your cooler says, you know, AM4 and requires that you re remove the back plate, it will not be compatible. And that's something that was causing a lot of confusion when AM5 was new because AMD said it's compatible with AM4 coolers. And that's only true if they use the AMD's clip mounting system which is what's pre-installed on there. One thing to keep in mind though is the AM5 only uses DDR5. So don't make that mistake of thinking that you can upgrade from DDR4 to a new platform and not get new memory. AM5, DDR5, just match the fives and you're good to go. Honorable mention regarding cooler compatibility though, another common mistake people will make is this one, it'd be very difficult to make. This is the Chromax air cooler from uh, Noctua. If it has a little plastic cover like this and has pre-installed thermal paste, you're probably gonna be fine. But if it's the kind of cooler that wants you to install the thermal paste that comes separately and it doesn't have a plastic piece, it might have a piece of clear plastic on the base of the cooler. Make sure you peel that off. Usually it will say, remove before use. It's still easy to install it without removing. 30 plus years and I've still done it a handful of times just in the last few years alone. Remove the plastic before you install it. That plastic makes a great insulator, not allowing heat to transfer to the block from the CPU and your CPU will run and it will turn on, but it will instantly throttle and you'll just be like, why is my computer running like that? And you take it off and then you go, oh. Now moving on to RAM, this is where things are becoming much more picky. And I don't mean picky as in like, People are picky. I think most people would just be happy using anything that works these days. DDR4 and DDR5, especially as we move on to DDR5, is extremely, extremely picky with QVL. Now QVL is basically the list that says this RAM with this speed and these timings is compatible with this motherboard and compatible with this CPU to be able to run in their optimized speeds. Remember, the speed that is printed on the RAM, whether it be DDR2, DDR3, DDR4, maybe not DDR2, but anyway, DDR3, 4, and five, the XMP or the Expo that they call it now on AMD, which was DOCP in the past, but now it's called Expo. Uh, these are actually overclocks. These are overclocked timing. They're tighter timings and overclocked frequencies that are designed uh, above and beyond the base spec of where RAM operates. DDR5's base speed is 4,000 megahertz. DDR4's base speed was 2133 and then it became like 2400 as it matured. If you had like a 3600 megahertz stick of RAM and you just put it in your system and don't touch it, it's gonna run at the 2133. Or DDR5 is gonna run at either 4000 or 4800 depending on the motherboard itself. Keep in mind, the moment you push enable Expo or enable XMP, it is going to be applying an overclock to the memory controller to run the speeds that are listed. What that means is a couple of things. One, it may not even be stable, it may not run. That is dependent on your CPU's silicon lottery winnings and the memory controller itself and 
the listed QVL compatibility between your particular sticks of RAM and the motherboard. So it's very important to always cross-reference the part numbers of the RAM you're trying to use with the motherboard you're picking to one, make sure that the motherboard has BIOS support for that particular RAM set. If you're choosing a DDR4 build today, it's very unlikely that it's gonna be a problem because we've had so many BIOS revisions with motherboards to create a vast supply of compatibility now with different RAM. DDR5, on the other hand, is still building out that list. You'll find that motherboards that run DDR5 are getting nearly monthly updates these days to support RAM as it comes out because as the RAM gets faster, it has to be supported. Now, a couple things that QVL will also teach you is not just what speed RAM and what capacity of RAM is gonna be supported because believe it or not, the capacity itself is also a limiting factor on compatibility. The more RAM, the faster it goes, the more hard it is on the memory controller. Now, one of the things that you'll find out too, is if you were running a dual channel motherboard, which is pretty much any motherboard these days with the exception of anything Xeon based or Threadripper based, it's gonna be two channels, channel A, channel B. Just because there's four, four sticks of RAM in the motherboard does not mean it's a four channel RAM or four channel motherboard. A lot of people get that confused. It just means there's two sticks per channel. So you have channel A1 and B1 and channel A2 and B2. So what a lot of folks will do is sometimes accidentally install the RAM sticks next to each other instead of leaving a space in between them. If you don't reference your motherboard manual, you might be sending this into single channel mode, which is actually giving half of the memory bandwidth available to the CPU, which is gonna affect everything with your computer. If, if you're one of those people right now that look at your RAM sticks and you see two next to each other and two empty, you're running yourself in single channel mode right now. If you were to pause this video, turn off your system, switch one of these sticks to another channel where there's a gap in between, doesn't even matter if it's the two outside or the two inside, because it can run in channel A1 or channel A2, it'll be fine. You would see an instant increase in peppiness of your system, responsiveness, app loading times, everything would get better. A lot, I see this all the time in our React series stuff is I would see sticks of RAM next to each other like this. And it's like, stop doing that. Um, the other thing is, if you want to occupy all four sticks of RAM, because you want max capacity, you may not even be able to activate your XMP or your Expo at all. There's a lot of RAM compatibility issues when it comes to maximizing all four sticks and running XMP as the memory gets faster and faster. Again, QVL will tell you everything that you need to know about whether or not you're wasting your money. You'd have to decide too, does your particular worst use case of your system deem that having maximum storage is more important than maximum speed? Then you can probably occupy all four and it'll work fine. Again. Verify with QVL. Some motherboards, if you occupy all four, won't even boot, which leaves you going, why the hell are there four sticks slots available anyway? We've experienced that where you put four sticks in and it doesn't even turn on. But the other thing too, is if you want to occupy all four and you find that like, okay, QVL says I can run all four sticks, you'd be surprised too, that sometimes your system will not run if you run two sets of dual sticks of RAM that are identical, same part numbers, same speeds, same timings, but they're two separate kits of two sticks, putting them together oftentimes will not run. It's, it, again, QVL will tell you all of this. So it's a, specifically XMP and Expo may not run. It's, it is what it is. It's been this way now since DDR4, it's been this way always, but DDR4 as the speeds got faster, it really started showing and DDR5 with them being like ragged edge speeds from day one, um, you'll find that it's just, Running four sticks more often than not is not the right way to go. In fact, it's why a lot of high-end motherboards have started only using two sticks, one stick per channel, especially if it's an overclocking motherboard because that's how you get the max stability. Um, obviously, double check too that you are matching DDR4 and four and five and five when it comes to your motherboards and stuff as I've already mentioned. The notch itself is different. Double check that notch is lining up. It's harder on DDR4 than DDR5. DDR5, it's nearly centered, so you might think you're lined up and it's not. DDR4, it's much more off-centered. Um, double check that before you go just shoving it down. You don't wanna be this guy. Let's move on to storage. Storage is simpler these days than it used to be. There's a lot of storage options. I mean, you've got so many brands out there now with all different types of NVMe drives. You got SATA SSDs and we still have obviously our hard drives. There's a lot of folks out there that still just, I did myself a big old reliable spinning drive and then just I 
spit on that new stuff. I'm sorry if you feel that way. Someday you'll come around. Anyway, drives, especially SSDs, NVMEs, and two and a half inch SATA drives have really dropped in price. NVMEs are a lot more affordable than they've ever been, but yes, they are still somewhat expensive. When you're installing Windows, you disconnect the drive you don't want Windows to be on. This isn't so much of a problem if you're running different size drives and you're smart enough to remember what size drive is what. For instance, I have a 500 gigabyte NVMe SSD right here. This is pretty small by, by today's standards and also pretty affordable. You could probably get this drive for like 35 bucks, which would make an amazing Windows drive. An SSD, especially an NVMe drive, makes an amazing Windows drive. You know what doesn't make amazing Windows drives these days? Spinning platter drives. Now let's, this is a one terabyte Toshiba, right? Yeah, just a high performance P300, super basic drive. Um, if these were both one terabyte drives though, after the partition space and whatnot, they might both show up as like 980 gigabyte or 968 gigabyte drives, whatever it ends up being. You get into the Windows installer and you're just like, oh, whatever, you just click the top one. You might accidentally be installing Windows on your spinning drive, but that wouldn't have been a problem if it wasn't plugged in at the time of installing Windows. So what I do is if I have, multiples of the same size drive in there and they're all NVMe. I don't personally care because of the fact that I'm not gonna go in and unplug my NVMe's, install Windows and then plug my NVMe's back in, especially if there's a graphics card in the way or it's vertical mounted and rigid tube, whatever. NVMe's, as long as it ends up on one, past that I don't really care. But if I have mixed drives, like Skunkworks was, I had a, just a weird pattern of drives all over the place. And when you go to install Windows, you'd see like 92 drives showing up and a lot of them were the same size. So I really had to get used to unplugging the drives I didn't want Windows on. Also too, sometimes Windows will put the bootloader on one drive and then the drive Windows OS on another drive, which then if you ever take the bootloader drive out and then the OS won't boot post anymore. It's, it's weird. So a lot less of an issue today, as long as you keep, drive, or keep track of which drives are which. Kind of an honorable mention there, something that is still throws a lot of people off today. All right, let's go ahead and talk about power supplies for a second here. This is another one where I, I see a lot of people really just have the wrong mentality of a power supply. There are so many more things to consider in a power supply than its wattage. Power supplies are not created equal. It's the whole reason why the 80 plus thing even came about. And it wasn't just, 80 plus doesn't tell you just about the efficiency of the power supply. It tells you about the quality of the parts inside the power supply. Because there's a reason why those efficiency ratings go up. The quality of parts go up with it. So what I have right here is just a basic 80 plus 500 uh, EVGA. It's like, there's, it's just 80 plus. It's like not even like 80 plus silver, which would use, or even bronze, which used to be like the start. It's just, it, it barely makes the 80 plus. Now there's nothing wrong with this power supply. In fact, we use it as our test power supply quite often. Um, but more often than not, you know, you're gonna be giving up things like modularity. As you can see, this is a non-modular power supply. As you can see, it's ketchup and mustard cables with like a transparent, non-fine mesh. It's just ugly. But because it's 80 plus, I would trust this with anything that needs up to 500 watts, but I wouldn't trust it if you were on the edge. And the reason for that is a lot of power supplies can provide power beyond its rated spec that it's showing if the quality is there. But you should never spec your system so that you're on the edge of the supplied rating of the power supply, or at least the advertised rating of the power supply. So for instance, this is an RM850X from Corsair. Um, I can't remember what the 80 plus on this one is. I think, well, I wanna say it's gold. I believe it's gold. You can often find the same power supply in multiple ratings. Not so much these days, almost everything is gold. Now when you see a bronze, it's really rare. Almost everything's gold and, and platinum now. But what you get with something like a higher end power supply is not just a higher wattage, you get the modularity of being able to unplug the cables that you don't want. You get individually sleeved cables as like just that's the way that they came, at least from Corsair. Um, and just overall, the build quality is better. Fortunately, power supplies are getting smaller. You can get a power supply this size, that's 1200 watts now. Whereas this is an 850 and look how much longer it is. And the longer power supplies take up more room in the bottom of your case, uh, which means less room for cable management and just less room for things. And it's like, you know, you should never spec your system for the minimum because of the fact that you give yourself zero expandability in the future. And power supplies are something that can live on for a long, long time in your system through multiple iterations, multiple upgrades, as long as you don't spec it too small. Let the 30 series and 40 series be a prime example. 
250 watts for graphics cards was the norm for the longest time. Then came 30 series with the 320 watt 3080 and the 350 watt 3090. Then came the 450 watt 4090 Ti or 3090 Ti and the 450 watt 4090, which can easily pull over 500 watts if you even start to play with the sliders whatsoever. 500 watt power supply would have been enough for what 250 watt graphics cards and 85 to 90 watt CPUs needed back in the day. This clearly wouldn't be enough to be able to run something like an RTX 4080 or 4090 in the future if you were trying to carry that power supply over, which means you'd have to upgrade your power supply. Now, speaking of power supplies, and I talked about cable management momentarily, one thing I highly recommend, and I've, and I've, I've taken a lot of people on their first PC building experience. I don't mean those of you watching that are like, hey, I built my first PC because I've watched your videos. No, I mean people that I've literally brought here and never made videos about, and I'm like, hey, you want to build yourself a computer? Come to my shop, we'll do it, I'll help you to learn. We'll have a great time. I see it a lot. People will plug their cables in and then start yanking on the cables to pull them tight and zip tie and cable manage. The problem with that is you start putting a lot of pressure on the headers. The 24 pin header, the eight pin EPS header, fan headers, RGB headers if plugged in, especially the USB 3.0 or USB 2.0 headers. Those are fine cables on the 2.0s. You could easily rip those out. And you start putting all kinds of unnecessary tension on those headers and you could potentially bend or break off or at the very least partially unplug. And then you're troubleshooting your system going, why are certain things not working? Why is my power button not working? Well, cause you yanked the front panel connector so hard you pulled them off. Then you're going through and doing a lot of troubleshooting. And if you've zip tied everything down, like it was some sort of a horror movie, like I do in my builds, then you're having to undo 6,200 zip ties just to be able to plug back in your front panel button. So things that you should keep in mind, don't bundle it too tight, don't yank on it too hard to try and get everything cable managed because you need to think about serviceability in the future. When it comes time to unplug things, if you're gonna need to change out a component, you need to troubleshoot. If you're trying to clean the system or do any sort of deep cleaning, having a little bit of slack on all the cables will still look fine, but it will allow you to be able to unplug cables when necessary and not sit there and, and potentially cause damage to your headers on your motherboard. Because if you ever try and price out how much it costs to get a header fixed or replaced by sending them to someone like Lewis Rossman or Chris Fix or whoever is, is repairing these systems, it's, it's not super cheap. Not to mention down, you have to mail it, you have to hope it doesn't get lost in the mail, hope it doesn't get damaged in the mail, and then hope that they can even fix it, that you didn't like rip pads off with it like I would do if I was trying to fix it. Don't bundle it too tight, okay? It's not like a man bun. You don't have to yank it super hard. Although man buns shouldn't exist anyway. Comment down below if you have a man bun and you're triggered now. Let's talk about fans here for a second. Fans are not hard to understand. I see a lot of people that still are like, which way does the fan go? I don't know, it's just which way, you know? And it's not difficult. Most fans will put a header or, or at least an arrow on the cage that shows one, the direction of airflow, and then two, the direction of the, the fan spinning. 99 times out of 100, the air is gonna flow from the open side of the fan, which means the side that does not have the hub support stilts through those supports. Okay, that means it's gonna go from the open side of the fan out the cage side of the fan. 99 out of 100. Every now and then you'll find some fans like we showed with the Montec Sky 2 case that have what's called a reverse fan, which means it's actually backwards. It's pulling air through the cage and out the other direction. That exists simply because of the fact of the side that the RGB ring is on, they make it so that it's always facing the interior of the case so you can see it. Those are very one-off. In fact, of all the years I've been doing YouTube, those are the first fans I've seen listed as reverse. I didn't know what the heck it meant until we looked into it and then we realized what it was. But I see it all the time where folks will have like, on the front of their case, it's like this, or it's like one intake, one exhaust because they just mounted it up and didn't think about it. I myself have done it a million times where like usually it's the rear fan where I'm just like, do, 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 do. Ah, crap, but I'm undoing it and turning it around and then getting adjusted so the cable's on the right side and all that. But fans don't have to be difficult. The front of your case should almost always be intakes. The top of your case should almost always be exhaust. And by the way, it's called exhaust, not outtake. An outtake is when I say something stupid and then fill that. Intakes on the front, exhaust on the top, exhaust on the back. When it comes to the amount of fans, 
We always prefer positive pressure around here, but modern cases has so much ventilation these days, it's almost always gonna be neutral pressure in some way anyway. If you have more intakes than you do exhaust, that's positive pressure, which is fine. It helps with dust. If you have more exhaust and you do intakes, it'll start pulling in air through gaps and other ventilation and such, but most cases have um, mesh on most of those intakes and stuff anyway. So there you go. Those are some of my 2023 don't make these mistakes building tips for you guys. This is where, you, look, There, you, you, we could make hundreds of these, hundreds of things that you shouldn't do. And this is where you should sound off in the comments below. What is your number one building mistake that you learned the hard way that you also think that uh, people could learn from? I think an honorable mention should be, before any of this, bench test your stuff. Put your CPU in your motherboard, put your cooler on it, put your RAM on it, put your power supply on it, put your graphics card on it, set it on the motherboard box, plug in the monitor. Do you get an image? Does it post? That's the first thing you should do before you build your system. Because if you need a motherboard BIOS update, most motherboards have BIOS flashback features and stuff built into them now, but at least you know it works before you get it in your case. And if it doesn't work after you get it in your case, you can start looking for pinched wires or unplugged stuff. So at least you know it's not bad componentry. All right guys, sound off with your best advice you have for a beginning builder of don't let this happen to you. And also don't let not being subscribed happen to you because I don't know, it's just what you're supposed to say as a YouTuber, subscribe and like and all that stuff.